All right, so we're gonna start entomology today. Um, entomology is basically bugs on deceased people. Um, and a lot of times the principal purpose of entomology is to try to establish when this person died, um, or if not their time of death, when their remains became accessible to insects. And so this is one of the specialties that works hand by hand, hand in hand with um, the anthropologist. So, yep, we're gonna be dealing with maggots and maggots come in all, you know, beautiful colors here. Um, um, so yeah, you know, they're gross. If you think of them as maybe like baby flies, you know, like puppies or kittens, maybe they're a little less repulsive. Um, if you've ever dealt with them personally, yeah, they're gross, okay? But they can be really useful forensically. And the main species, we're actually gonna talk about a bunch of different species, but the main species we'll be talking about is this guy, which I'm sure you are all familiar with because this is your garden variety housefly. Um, the technical term for this guy is a blowfly. And so that's the term that you'll be hearing me use throughout this presentation. So once again, we take a scientific discipline, um, we relate it to uh, what either civil or criminal matters and boom, you know, there you go. So entomology is the study of arthropods, okay? So notice I'm not saying just insects. Um, insects are certainly arthropods, but there are different kinds of living creatures that also fit into that category. So. What arthropods have in common is they are invertebrates, meaning that they don't have an internal skeleton, okay, like you do. Um, and in fact, they have an exoskeleton, which means their skeleton is on the outside. And it's made of a really um, tough carbohydrate material called chitin. Okay, so this is why when you go to Red Lobster, you order that lobster tail um, or crab claws. You know, you're not gonna sit there and chew on the actual claws or the shell of the lobster. Um, you are incapable of digesting it and all of those shells are made up of chitin. Okay, it's also why arthropods, um, when they get bigger, they have to actually shed their skeletons and then grow new ones, okay, in a, a process that we call molting. Arthropods also have jointed appendages and they have at least six, but sometimes many, many more legs. <coughs> oh, just a little bit about entomology too. Um, so if you wanna get a degree in entomology, if you go to any big ag school, that's where you usually find those departments. So you can major in entomology at Iowa State, you know, Kansas, Nebraska, South Dakota, uh, Colorado, any of those um, schools that a lot of times have a vet school um, or are associated with agriculture. So here are some other examples of arthropods. So yeah, all of the insects are put in here, whether it's, you know, um, you know fleas, cockroaches, um, you know, spiders, um, mites, lice, things like that. Um, but then you also can expand that to an aquatic environment. So when we talk about shrimp, uh, lobsters, crab, um, and also land creatures like scorpions, um, or this gigantic, this is about a six foot long millipede, which has 10 million legs and Yet another reason why we'll never visit the tropical rainforest because the bugs there are just way too big and scary. So here are some of the things that an entomologist may be able to determine. And it's kind of like blood spatter. I mean, they're not gonna be able to determine everything on the list, but if you can hit a couple of these, that's awesome. Um, so in certain cases, they may be able to help determine the cause of death. Um, they can help determine whether a body has been moved post-mortem, um, simply because when you move a body, especially if it's in an outdoor environment, um, you'd be surprised how just a little change in the environment um, ends up having completely different species of bugs. Um, so even just moving like from a meadow to a forest environment, you're gonna have completely different species. One of the interesting things they do that doesn't involve a body is looking at drug evidence 
or you know what we're calling contraband and simply by looking at the species of microscopic bugs that you can see um, you can tell you know where was this uh, where were these drugs produced was it in South America I mean you're not going to be able to nail it down to a particular town but you could certainly say you know this came from Colombia you know as uh, opposed to Mexico simply because the insect life is going to be different so um, yeah, I'm gonna show you some pictures of decomposing pigs, okay? Um, and obviously we've talked about decay and decomposition, but I want you to look at this in terms of um, the insect evidence, okay? So initial decay, full-blown decomp has not started here, but what's gonna happen is always, always, always the first species that are gonna be attracted to a dead organism are going to be the blowflies. And blowflies have such an incredible sense of smell that, you know, there can be something that, you know, basically is either right at the verge of death or has just died. Now you could be standing right next to that, you know, let's say it's a pig and you would smell nothing, but a fly a couple miles away is gonna be like, whoa, something just died. And it's gonna follow the trail of those airborne volatile compounds um, right to that dead organism. So um, usually the first species of fly is going to start arriving at this dead animal or human in about 30 minutes and then they're gonna start laying eggs. And also the insects are going to be attracted only to moist areas of the body, okay? So normally that means something with a mucous membrane. So eyes, ears, mouth, you know, nostrils, um, you know, if it's a human, if the human is nude, could be uh, the rectal and urogenital regions. And if there's some type of wound that has blood with it, so if there's a stab wound, a gunshot wound but with blood, um, because that has moisture and it's wet, they will be attracted to that too. Where they're not gonna land is going to be on intact skin simply because it's more dry, and so they're not gonna be attracted to that. The reason they're attracted to those moisture areas is because once they lay their eggs, the eggs are pretty pretty fragile and they can dry out really fast, a, a process that we call desiccation. And if the eggs dry out, there's no chance of them hatching. And so, you know, the, the mom fly wants to, you know, give her potential little babies um, the best chance. And so she's gonna lay those eggs somewhere where there's moisture associated with it. Okay, next we're heading into full-blown decomp or what we call putrefaction. So this is when the eggs that have been laid by flies are gonna start to hatch into maggots and um, they're gonna go through life cycles. And so you'll see adult flies start to emerge. You're also going to see different species of flies arrive at the body at different times. So. There are actually over 90 different species of blowflies that have been identified thus far in the world. Um, so for example, you know, here in the Midwest, you may have maybe nine or 10 different species, but they're all attracted to the body at a slightly different time. So the first species gets there and starts laying eggs, you know, right after death. And then maybe, uh, you know, 48 hours later, that's when the next species is attracted because they like the body a little more decomposed. Um, and on and on it goes. So this is where the eggs are gonna start to hatch and you're gonna start to see maggot masses. Um, notice also that, you know, as with decomposition, the body started to turn this greenish brown. You've got purge fluid coming out. Okay, now 10 to 20 days after death, that's when the maggot masses are gonna be there in full force. And probably a lot of you have seen this in action. If you, you know, come across a raccoon that's being, uh, you know, uh, eaten by maggots or, you know, a dead squirrel or something. So um, maggot masses can actually work really fast. They can eat up to an inch of soft tissue, um, you know, kind of per hour. Um, and if you have really huge masses, yeah, they can, you know, get through that animal pretty quickly. So notice that you also have adult flies. Now these can be flies that could be potentially emerging from the babies 
um, that were the eggs that were first laid at the beginning, or they're also species, different species that are coming in later and being attracted to that body. But this is where now those maggot masses are gonna be rolling. Um, they're gonna be destroying a lot of that tissue. Okay, up to about, you know, roughly a couple months from a, a month to two months after death, um, that's when, you know, most of the fluids are going to be gone. Um, and the thing about blowflies is they are attracted to bodies that still have a lot of fluids in them. So once you see dry decay happening, and you know, this is an animal that's been out there long enough that, you know, if you were to pass this, like if you're walking on a trail and this dead animal was off to the side, you wouldn't even smell it anymore because all of the fluids are gone. So you do see a couple of large late stage maggots crawling around here. Those would be from the last species. Um, but now you're gonna see different species of insects come in because the flies aren't gonna be attracted to um, you know, a body that is this dry. So now you're gonna see the beetles come in, okay? So flies come first, followed by beetles. And then later you get different species like gnats and moths that will come in. One thing I do want to show you on this photo um, though, and let me zoom in on this. So you'll notice these little brown things um, that kind of resemble rodent droppings. Those are actually what we call pupa casings. And so the maggots, when they are done feeding, and uh, a late stage maggot is gonna look like this, it's gonna be kind of beige in color. The maggots actually migrate away from the body because to go through their final development into an adult fly, they need to be someplace where it's cool and protected. And then they can actually migrate up to about, you know, 50, 60 feet away from the body. Um, so all of this, it's not rodent droppings, it's actually valuable entomological evidence that should be collected for the entomologist to do his or her job. Okay, and then finally, you know, when the, the body is really, really dry, there's nothing more to decompose, the beetles are now gone, now you're gonna look at species such as moths, gnats, mites, um, that are gonna feed really on, you know, cartilage, ligaments, t you know, dried tissue. They're not attracted to the body um, when it is full of fluids. So let's say you go to Iowa State and you get um, a degree in entomology. So there are, and let's say you decide you wanna go into forensic entomology, okay? So that's the big category. Then within forensic entomology, there are three different um, disciplines that you can go into. Okay, so the first one is urban. And what urban means, it's dealing with infestations that occur, you know, either in man-made dwellings like houses or, you know, um, you know, office buildings, or it has to do with landscape plants. Okay, so for example, let's say you guys are living with some roommates at Kirkwood. Um, unfortunately, you have a crappy landlord, you get a cockroach infestation, um, you know, and the landlord doesn't do anything about it. You know, potentially you could hire an urban entomologist. They would come in, document the infestation, and you could use that report to then sue your landlord. Okay, urban entomologists are not the same thing as an orchid guy or a pest control person. They're not treating the problem, they're basically documenting it. Um, stored product is things that ugh, we probably all fear, all right? So when you hear about, oh my God, I found a cockroach in my, um, you know, my burger that I, that I bought from Burger King or wherever. Um, or there's some type of consumable, whether it's, you know, cereal or, you know, dried soup mix or even paper products like paper towels, toilet paper. When you have an infect, insect infestation in something like that, you hire a stored product entomologist. And these are guys that are usually employed by big companies like General Mills, you know, any type of warehouse company. So they wanna go through, check for infestations and then solve the problem. Um, you know, is the temperature up too high and it's allowing these things to germinate? Did we get um, contaminated things in from another company and that's where the problem's coming from? I mean, the, the reality is 
we're all eating bug parts in, you know, when we buy boxes of cereal and other things, but the FDA has a certain guideline, like you can only have two legs and a thorax per, you know, box of Cheerios or whatever. Um, and if it goes above that, yep, then there's a problem. And that's what a stored product entomologist is. So the one that we're gonna deal with mostly because this is a forensic science class where we're talk talking about criminal cases and dead bodies, that is the medico criminal aspect. And what this involves is most of the time calculating what is known as the PMI, which stands for post-mortem interval. And what that means is how long has this person been dead based on the um, evidence that is left on the body in the form of insects, okay? So it's determining the PMI. Um, it can also um, tell them about the location of death, you know, so was this body moved after death? Um, and then other various criminal misuses of insects. Um, and you'd be surprised the types of cases there are, and I'll give you some examples of those. Okay, so I'm at the 15 minute mark. I'm gonna stop here. We'll pick up here next time. Thank you.